Hi, my name is Kay Moon Dreamer, and I'd like to share with you some of what I have learned about Native American herbology. This is a learning about how to use the plants of this continent, this turtle island, and how to use them in a respectful way. All over the world, throughout time, people have turned to herbs as a natural way of healing. The World Health Organization tells us that at least 80% of the world's population still relies on traditional forms of healing such as herbs. In fact, Western medicine, or allopathic medicine, finds its roots in herbal medicine. From our anesthetics that are based on cocaine, to our pain-killing drugs based on the poppy plant, to our decongestants based on ephedra. One of the reasons that many herbalists prefer natural herbs to synthetic drugs is because synthetic drugs consist of isolated active ingredients. In the natural herb, there are other ingredients, often called inert ingredients, and these work to neutralize and buffer any potential side effects. Not to say that there aren't side effects with herbs, but they aren't as likely as with synthetic drugs. The FDA, which is our Food and Drug Administration, is currently working to remove many traditional and time-tested remedies from over-the-counter availability, and either to ban them completely or to move them to, to prescription status. These herbs include peppermint oil, eucalyptus oil, camphor, castor oil, many digestive enzymes, damiana, ginseng, and hawthorn. Many believe that this is misguided, as the New England Journal of Medicine in 1981 reported that 36 percent of all hospital admissions are due to previous medical treatment. If you think that this work that the FDA is doing is wrong, please write or call your legislators. There are many differences between conventional medicine and holistic medicine. In conventional medicine, often we work to suppress symptoms. In this view, health is seen as an absence of disease, and the emphasis is on treatment and dependence. In the holistic paradigm, health is seen as a positive state. The emphasis here is on education and empowerment. An example of the different ways that we can treat an illness would be with someone with a digestive problem in conventional treatment, this person would be given a drug which would suppress the symptom, and often this drug would create severe side effects. In a holistic treatment of this person, we would provide them with dietary counseling, stress management training, and other holistic forms of dealing with stress. When deciding what type of remedy to use for an illness, a good question that we can ask ourselves is, Will this remedy help to increase the person's integrity and restore their move towards, back towards balance? Or will the remedy decrease their integrity and suppress the move back to balance? In allopathic or conventional medicine, often the move is to suppressing symptoms, which all too often suppresses health. An example of the different ways that we might treat the same illness would be in the case of an infection. In an infection, if we use a chemical antibiotic, we would weaken the body's own innate defense system, seriously disturb the intestinal flora, and in an evolutionary sense, we create highly resistant bacteria. The natural approach would be using something like echinacea. If we used echinacea, what we would be doing is stimulating the body's own immune system. So you can see that there are two different approaches. In one, we suppress the symptoms of a disease, and in the other, we restore the body to health. The natural healer sees symptoms as a positive sign. These are signs that the body's own defense mechanisms are working well. In fact, symptoms are often supported and even encouraged. The case of a fever would be a good example of how a natural symptom is actually supported. In conventional medicine, a fever is usually suppressed using aspirin. In natural healing, a fever is seen as a good sign. In fact, by raising the body's temperature by from 2 to 5 degrees higher than normal, germs and bacteria are actually destroyed naturally by the body. 
Another example of this would be in the case of nasal secretions. In conventional medicine, people use sprays and other forms of drying up the nasal secretions. The problems with this is that often there's an overdrying of the nose. People lose their sense of smell and taste for extended periods of time. And the constriction of blood vessels often results in increased pulse rate and blood pressure. In the natural approach to nasal secretions, they're seen as beneficial. In fact, they're removing unwanted viruses and bacteria from the body. So we would actually encourage these by using an expectorant herb, which means an herb which increases the flow of mucus from the body. An example of this would be using thyme. Gathering herbs yourself is a very rewarding experience but you're going to want to make sure that you gather from places where there's no chance of pesticide or other chemical contamination. You won't want to gather near roadsides, power lines that might have been sprayed, farm fields that might have been sprayed, forests now are being sprayed often for gypsy moth. You're also going to want to avoid places where dogs might have gone as they can pass parasites to people. If you buy your herbs, you're going to want to know your source. At least 80% of all the herbs in the U.S. have been imported. And you might have already heard about the circle of poison, which affects our food. What this means is that pesticides that are banned in this country are used on crops, including herbs, in other countries. Then those products are sold back into this country and consumed here. So you probably are going to want to make sure that you don't get imported herbs. Many herbs have also been irradiated. This is a process used to extend their shelf life. However, many believe that it will decrease their potency. Another problem is that commercial herb warehouses are required to fumigate their contents. And the chemicals used for fumigation are toxic. You'll want to store your herbs as whole as possible. And you're going to want to keep them in a dark, cool place. You're going to also want to check them occasionally as they can reabsorb moisture. And if they do that, you'll need to dry them again. You'll want to store your herbs in airtight glass containers. Most herbs should only be stored for a year, with the exception of roots and tinctures. And make sure that you label your herbs well. Respect the plants that you are using and be aware of individuality, the individuality of each person and of each plant. Your remedies may not work right if they are not prepared correctly and they can only be as as good quality as the herbs that you start with. In the Native American tradition, plants are said to have a medicine power. This is not the same as an active ingredient. All plants contain the same life force that flows through all of creation. And becoming attuned to this oneness is in itself healing. Using herbs can help attune us to the natural world. They are a gift from the Earth Mother and can help us develop a deeper relationship with all of creation. To Native Americans, developing a respectful relationship with the Earth Mother is very important. And I hope that what I've shared with you today in this video will help you to share my love for all of creation. In the Native American tradition, herbs are gathered in an attitude of respect and gratitude. Herbs are viewed as a gift from our Earth Mother, something that we don't gather without having gratitude. When we want to gather an herb, first we make sure that we have positively identified the herb. Then a good thing to do is to find the grandmother plant and ask her permission. Tell her how you want to use her grandchildren. Then close your eyes, go within for a moment. And if and when you receive her permission, it's good to leave an offering. 
I like to leave cornmeal Other people might like to leave a prayer or an offering of tobacco. This is golden seal. Golden seal is becoming endangered as more and more people turn to herbs as a natural way of healing themselves. More and more plant species are becoming endangered. If we would gather plants in the way that Native Americans have traditionally gathered them, this wouldn't happen. In fact, we try to increase the plant population. With gathering a plant like golden seal, where usually the root is used, this is particularly a problem. So we'd want to try to leave pieces of the root in the ground. If the plant has seeds, we want to spread the seeds. We want to increase the plant population. When we gather plants, we want to make sure that we gather the right part of the plant at the right time of the year. We want to make sure that we gather the particular part when it has its most energy or power. In gathering a plant like the golden seal, which we usually use the root, this would mean that we either gather it in the spring or the fall. If we gather it in the fall, we gather after several hard frosts, when the top part of the plant has died back. When we gather flowers, we gather the flowers of a plant just as they're coming into full bloom. And when we gather leaves, we generally gather them before flowering. Golden seal was used extensively by the Cherokee Indians. They used an infusion or a tea for all types of eye problems. They used the powdered root externally for all types of cuts and wounds and even for external cancers. Native Americans also used a tea of golden seal for all types of stomach and liver ailments. They used it for hepatitis, gonorrhea, colds, and all types of infections. They even used golden seal mixed with bear grease as an insect repellent. Golden seal is a powerful tonic for the mucous membranes. Because of this, it is good to use it for all types of digestive problems, for colitis, gastritis, ulcers. It's also a bitter stimulant, which makes it good for loss of appetite. Golden seal is a perennial herb, meaning that it comes back year after year. It has a single leaf attached to the stem with five to nine lobes. It flowers in the spring with a small whitish flower. And one of the ways that you can identify it is by the spike that's left after the flower. Another way that you can identify golden seal is by its distinctive yellow root. Anyone that's ever used or tasted golden seal will be able to tell by its smell or its taste. It's very bitter. Recent research has found that golden seal is effective against both E. coli and staph infection. This would explain its long use in all types of upper respiratory disease and all types of infections. Research has also found that it contains berberin, which is effective for helping bile secretion in the body. What this means is that golden seal is very good for helping in both digestion and elimination. Recent research has also found that golden seal acts to lower blood pressure and it's a mild sedative. Another way that golden seal has been used is externally for things like eczema, ringworm, all types of cuts and wounds. An easy way to use it is to gather a leaf bruise it with your hands or put it into a mortar and pestle, mash it up, and then apply it externally. It's also used dried and powdered and sprinkled onto wounds. Another way that you can use golden seal externally is to make an ointment with it. One of the most common ways to use golden seal is to make a tea. You want to put one teaspoon into a cup pour a cup of boiling water over it. 
let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes and most people would drink about a cup three times a day. There are some cautions concerning golden seal that I'd like to share with you. Although golden seal is occasionally used during childbirth, it should be avoided during pregnancy. It's a very strong herb and it can stimulate contractions of the uterus. Golden seal can also be toxic in large doses and it seems to store in the fatty tissue of the body and can cause irritation of the mucous membranes in the body. If you use golden seal, don't use it for more than a week. And it seems to irritate intestinal flora. So you'll want to use something like acidophilus or a good quality yogurt while and after you're using golden seal. This is my friend, Echinacea. Echinacea is more commonly known as the purple cone flower. Echinacea is native to the central United States, and the Indians in the Plains area considered echinacea to be a panacea or a cure-all, and they used echinacea more than any other herb. Echinacea is a perennial plant, which means that it comes back year after year. It's a stout plant with rough, jagged leaves that attach to the stem, and it's most distinctive for its cone, with the dull purple flower petals that fall down from the cone as the flower matures. The Kiowa chewed the fresh root of the echinacea plant and swallowed the juice for sore throat and coughs. Echinacea is probably most effective when used the way that the Native Americans used it, either chewing the fresh root or using the fresh root as a poultice applied externally or in general just using the root fresh. Research has found that extracts of the fresh root is more effective than the dried root. Echinacea was used extensively by Native Americans. It was used for colds, flus, infections, snake bites, insect bites, spider bites. It's considered a folk remedy for the brown recluse spider bite. Our body has two different types of immune system. One of these is the specific immune system. This system works by a type of a memory that remembers which type of invaders have been in the body before. The other system is the nonspecific immune system. This immune system works through what's called macrophages, which are white blood cells which attack, attack invaders in the body. Echinacea works by stimulating the nonspecific immune system. This is particularly relevant because many of our modern illnesses viral infections, specifically AIDS, are continually changing their surface structure. Thus, they need to be attacked by the nonspecific immune system. So echinacea is good for all kinds of infections. It's good for viral infections, bacterial infections. It's good for all problems of the upper respiratory tract, like laryngitis and tonsillitis. It's also good for external infections. Things like boils, carbuncles, all kinds of wounds, cuts. When we want to use echinacea to treat an external infection, the best way to do it would be to get the fresh root. And then we could either chew it or grind it up in a mortar and pestle. Then we take the ground plant material and apply it right to the infection. The root of the echinacea plant is the part that is most commonly used. Ideally, we gather the root in the plant's third to the fourth year, and we gather it in the fall, after the plant has died back. This is the root. Remember, the fresh root, or the fresh root extract, or freeze-dried, would be the preferable way to use echinacea. One of the ways that we can tell that echinacea is still potent is that it should leave a tingling sensation in the mouth. If it doesn't, then you'll know that what you have bought is not effective any longer. Even though the root of the echinacea plant is the part that has been used traditionally, many people now are also using the leaves and flowers. It seems that they contain the same kinds of ingredients as the root, it's just that the root is much stronger. This is burdock. Cherokee women used burdock before and after labor to strengthen the womb. 
The Cherokee also used burdock for gravel, rheumatism, scurvy, and venereal diseases. The Chippewa used burdock as a blood purifying medicine, and the Ojibwe used burdock for pain, for stomach ailments, and as a general tonic. Burdock is a very hardy plant growing from six to eight feet tall. It's also biennial, which means that it grows for two years. In its second year of growth, it forms purplish pink clusters of flowers that bloom in the summer, and then in the fall, they become the notorious burr. Burdock has a long history as a blood purifier. It is often one of the main ingredients in blood purifying remedies. It is renowned for its use in psoriasis and eczema if used over a long period of time. It is also good for all types of rheumatic complaints. One of the easiest and most effective ways to use burdock is to eat it. You can gather the first year root, peel it, steam it, and eat it. You can also gather the new stalks as they come up in the spring and use those in salad or steam them. One can also use the young, young leaves in salad. Another way that we can use the burdock plant is to make a tea or an infusion with the root. To do this, we would take one teaspoon of the root and boil it in one cup of water for 10 to 15 minutes. You would want to drink a cup of this three times a day. Burdock also has a long history of use in healing external problems. The fresh bruised leaf can be used for things like burns, ulcers, wounds, poisoning, rashes, any kind of skin ailment. We could either use it directly by bruising the leaf in a mortar and pestle and applying it directly to the skin. Or if you have sensitive skin, you might prefer to make a compress. And this would mean bruising or macerating the leaf in a mortar and pestle then putting it between a couple sheets of cheesecloth and then applying it directly to the skin wherever you need it. Burdock has been favored for conditions like rheumatism and gout. Either an infusion or a tincture of the seeds is used for gout. One could also apply the leaves bruised externally to gout or other arthritic conditions. Burdock is also a healer of urinary and kidney problems, being a good blood cleanser. Blood cleansers work by nourishing, strengthening, and toning the entire body. Burdock also works by helping to support the body in eliminating toxins. This would explain its use in chronic illnesses like rheumatism. If you were to use burdock in a chronic illness, it would have to be used over a long period of time. It's believed that because chronic illnesses have developed over a long period of time, that it will also take a long time to heal oneself of these illnesses. As is the case with many herbs, the fresh root of burdock seems to be more effective than the dry root. The fresh root has been found to also be effective against bacteria, and fungal infections. Drying, grinding, and storing the root seems to dissipate many of its healing properties. Burdock would be a good plant for you to bring into your life. It is both nourishing and purifying. This is peppermint. The Cherokee used peppermint for fever and headaches, colds, cramps, colic, and cholera. The Menomini tribe used peppermint and other mints for pneumonia. And the Cree used mints for sore throat. The peppermint is a perennial plant, meaning it comes back every year. Peppermint likes to grow in cool, moist places. And peppermint is one of the most widely used herbs in the world. Peppermint has hairless, dark green leaves, which are lance-shaped, and it flowers from July through September. To harvest pep peppermint, you want to gather it before it flowers and cut it back to about three inches above the ground. 
Some of the most popular uses for the mints is for things like indigestion, gas, the urge to vomit. Peppermint works in a couple ways. One of these is as an antispasmodic and it relaxes the stomach and other internal muscles. It also works by supporting bile secretion and helps the digestive system to work better. Peppermint also has a long and traditional use for colds, flus, and fevers. One of the ways that it helps is by supporting perspiration. Peppermint is a strong stimulant and what it does is it brings blood to the surface of the skin and then sweating and evaporation helps take the heat away from the body. The Chinese even like to drink a hot peppermint tea in the summertime to help them stay cool. Recent studies have found that peppermint is effective against the herpes virus and other viruses. Other studies have also found peppermint to work as a strong anti-inflammatory and to have anti-ulcer activity. Peppermint has been used by many as a remedy for gas. In Europe now, it's also being used in a special capsule form for irritated bowel syndrome. Recent studies have found that menthol, which is one of the active ingredients in the mints, has slight antiseptic properties. The mints are also supposed to be antimicrobial, which means they are effective against bacterial infections. Peppermint, being a stimulant, makes an excellent coffee substitute, and it also doesn't have the side effect of coffee of being overstimulating. One word of warning about peppermint. You can buy something called the essential oil of peppermint in the store. This is extracted through a highly complicated process, so it's not something that you could create yourself. But this essential oil of peppermint can be toxic if taken internally, so needs to be used with care. Its major chemical constituent, menthol, has also been known to cause allergic reactions. Peppermint would be an excellent tea for all those people in our society who have digestive problems, which are so often related to our stress-filled way of living. This is the mullen, also known as velvet dock and the flannel flower. The Hopi smoked the leaves of the mullen for fits and seizures. The Mohegan smoked the leaves for asthma and sore throat, and they used a tea for coughs. The Navajo smoked the plant for both fever and coughs. The Potawatomi smoked or smudged the leaves of the mullen for asthma, catarrh, and used the leaves in a vinegar fomentation for inflamed tumors. This means that they would soak the leaves in vinegar and then apply the leaves externally to the tumor. The Penobscot smoked the leaves for asthma, and the Cherokee scalded the leaves and used them on swollen glands, such as mumps. The flowers will open a few at a time, so you'll need to be gathering them over a couple week period. Put the flowers into a glass container, then cover them with olive oil. You're going to want to let that sit for about a week, and after a week's time, you're going to want to strain that out, and then you're going to have mullen oil. To use mullen oil for an ear infection, you want to put a couple drops at room temperature into the ear three times a day. The leaves of the mullen plant are also vulnerary, which means they are healing to wounds. One way that you could use the mullen plant for this would be to remove the leaf and macerate it in, with, in a mortar and pestle, grind it up until it's softened, and to apply it to a wound. One could also use the juice from the flowers or the leaves and use those on warts. Mullen has a long history of use for respiratory problems. The reason that it helps is that it helps to tone the respiratory system and it helps the body eliminate mucus. It can be used in this way for colds and bronchitis and asthma. You can make yourself a tea by putting a quarter cup of dried flowers into an airtight container like a canning jar, cover it with a pint of boiling water, 
Screw the top on tightly, let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes, strain it, and drink one cup three times a day. Research has found that the mullein flowers have antibacterial properties. Another thing that you might also want to know about mullein is that the flowers are stronger than the leaves. Mullein can be found all over and it seems to prefer waste places. In my experience, I would recommend mullein for all types of respiratory ailments, whether it be cold, bronchitis, asthma, any other type of respiratory problems that you might have. This is Sister Yarrow. She's a perennial herb, meaning she comes back year after year, and she's found throughout most of North America. She has feathery leaves, and the flowers of yarrow can be either white, pale lilac, or yellow. But the white wild variety is the type that is most often used for healing. The flower, the leaves, and the stem all can be used for healing. Yarrow has a long tradition of use within the Native American healing tradition. It can be used for colds, fevers, kidney problems. Being a diuretic, it works well for urinary tract problems. Yarrow is a diuretic, which means it helps to stimulate the elimination of urine from the body. Because of this, it has a long history of use for urinary tract infections, such as cystitis. Yarrow also has a long history of use for external problems. In fact, one of its folk names is wound wart. Yarrow is astringent, which means it tightens tissue. So it's been used for wounds, it's used for burns, rashes, stings, and yet all other kinds of skin problems. Yarrow has a long history of use for colds and flus. It is expectorant, which means that it helps the body to expel mucus. It is analgesic, which means it is pain reducing. And it is diaphoretic, which means that it is sweat promoting. All of these will help with cold and flu symptoms. To make a yarrow tea, you'll want to take two teaspoons of the dried herb, put them into an airtight container, pour a cup of boiling water over it, seal the jar, let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes, and you want to drink one cup three times a day. You can also use yarrow externally by applying the powdered herb directly to a wound, and in this way it will help stop the bleeding. There are a couple warnings that I'd like to give you about yarrow. One is that in highly sensitive people it can cause some skin irritation, and the other is that extended use may cause skin sensitivity to the light. This is plantain, which the Native Americans nicknamed white man's foot because it seemed to follow them wherever they went. Plantain grows wild all over the United States and is a very common herb. It is a perennial herb, meaning it comes back year after year. If you want to use the leaves, you'd want to gather them before the seed stalks form. If you want to use the seeds of the plant, you gather them in the fall and the seeds are used as a bulk laxative in Appalachia. Plantain has many uses. One of its common uses is for wounds and all types of external problems. I was taught that it is called Band-Aid plant and what we do to use it is we take a leaf, chew it, and apply it as a band-aid. It's astringent, so it will help stop bleeding. It's good for insect bites and all types of wounds. It's also called snake weed, and it was used by many tribes for snake bites. Research has found that plantain is both antibacterial and stimulating to the healing process. So we shouldn't be surprised when we find out that Native American tribes have used plantain for rattlesnake bites, 
for all types of wounds, for rheumatism, bruises, blisters, burns, ulcers, and other sores. The Cherokee also used tea of plantain for bites, for douches, and for swelling. Plantain has a long traditional use as a blood purifier. To use it in this way, you would take two teaspoons of the dried herb, cover it with a cup of boiling water, cover the container tightly, let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes, and drink one cup three times a day. Plantain has also been used for coughs and other types of respiratory problems. It works in this way by helping the body to expel mucus and it also soothes the inflamed mucus membranes within the respiratory system. You can also use plantain to make a plantain cough syrup. To do this, you would take two ounces of fresh plantain leaves, preferably gathered before the seed stalks form. Put that into a pan, add two cups of water Cover your pan and gently simmer for 10 minutes. Then you're going to strain the herb out. Then you're going to add three cups of brown sugar. Bring it to a, just a gentle, gentle boil. And as soon as the sugar is dissolved, turn off the heat. And you're going to want to keep that in a well-stoppered container. It should keep for about six months and you'll use that one or two teaspoons as needed. Plantain has traditionally been used fresh, applied externally for wounds and other skin problems. Another way that it can be used externally is to make an herbal oil with it. To do this, you'd want to gather the fresh plantain leaves, fill a clean jar to the top as full as you can with the leaves, then pour a good quality herbal oil into the jar. You actually will be filling it a second time with the oil. Then you're going to want to seal it and let it sit for a few weeks until it turns a nice green color. Then you're going to want to strain out all of the herbal material and you'll have a plantain herbal oil which will be very good for skin healing. This is Sister Elder. She grows in the eastern and central United States. She's a deciduous shrub, which means that she loses her leaves every winter. As she gets older, she develops a grayish brown bark. In the spring to early summer, she develops large clusters of yellowish golden flowers, which are followed by the elderberries which are purplish blue clusters of berries. The flowers of the elder bush have been used by Native Americans for colds, flu, and fever. The berries have been made into juice or wine for rheumatism. And the bark and the leaves are used as an emetic, which means they help vomiting, and a purgative, which helps in the cleansing of the intestinal system. The leaves of Sister Elder have traditionally been used by Native Americans for all types of ailments of the skin. They've been used for boils, burns, and wounds. Basically, the different parts of the elder are used for different healing purposes. The leaves are usually used externally for all types of burns, sprains, strains, even for external uh, tumors or cancers. The flowers of elder are diaphoretic, which means that they encourage sweating, and they've traditionally been used for all kinds of colds and flus. A traditional remedy for colds or flu is mixing the elder flower with peppermint leaves and making a strong tea with this. The flowers of the elder are also expectorant, which means they encourage the expectoration of mucus from the body. Because of this, they're used for any type of excess mucus in the upper respiratory system, such as hay fever and all types of allergies. The berries of the elder have similar properties to the flowers. They're also rich in vitamin C. 
They encourage perspiration, and this would probably explain their long use for both colds and rheumatism. The root, bark, leaves, and unripe berries of the elder are said to cause cyanide poisoning and severe diarrhea, so they should not be used internally. Many herbalists also believe that the berries should only be used when they are fully ripe. My favorite way to use the elder is to make a strong tea or infusion with the flowers for all of the uncomfortable symptoms of both colds and flu. This is blue cohosh, also known as squaw root and papoose root, which tells us of its long history of use for childbirth. Blue cohosh grows in the woods of the eastern and central United States. Its single stem branches into three more stems. It has yellowish green flowers which bloom in the early spring and summer. And its fruit looks like blue berries. The fruit, which looks like berries, have poisoned children, and they are toxic. You might want to warn your children against eating these. Blue cohosh has a long history of use for childbirth. It is a menagogue, which means it will help to bring on a delayed period. It is antispasmodic and has been used to ease the pains of false labor. It's also used to tone the uterus and has a long use among American Indian women to help facilitate childbirth. Blue cohosh should be used with medical supervision. If used for childbirth, you would want to seek the help of an experienced midwife or other health care practitioner. Blue cohosh has been used by many Native American tribes for chronic rheumatism. It's also been used for bronchitis, colic, and all types of nervous system disorders. Blue cohosh is traditionally used as a tea. You'd put one teaspoon of the dried root into a pan, add one cup of water, simmer for 10 minutes. The traditional use is one cup three times a day.